All righty. Good morning, everybody. I see our attendees are trickling in here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and I see some names I recognize from all around the world. So it's good to see some, you know, folks here from everywhere. Alrighty, wonderful. Well, we're going to give it just a few more seconds for people to trickle in here before we get started. But thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Olivia Lounsbury. I'm the Quality and Safety Programs Manager for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So I'm really excited to see all these names on the screen and, you know, get to learn from some of our panelists today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We are focusing on We Can't Do This Alone. So the role that patients, family members, and the general public play in advancing patient safety. Um, so our objectives here today are to understand the current policy work happening around the world, uh, to recognize the importance of regulation and legislation in advancing patient safety, to discuss the importance of regulatory oversight, and to examine actionable recommendations for patients, family members, and members of the general public in policy work. So we've got quite a lot in store for you here today and definitely a few actionable recommendations that you can take home with you towards the end. I do wanna emphasize that we are offer, offering BCPA CE credit. So these are for our board certified patient advocates. We're offering one BCPA CE credit and participants will receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation within about five to seven days of this webinar. Um, so I do just wanna do a few uh, you know, housekeeping reminders here. Uh, you have both a chat and a Q&A function. Um, go ahead and use the chat to reflect on any of the insights from panelists to add any of your remarks in there. And if you want our, your question to be answered live during the uh, last 15 minutes of this webinar, go ahead and put it in the Q&A um, and somebody from our team will be monitoring that so that we get you know, hopefully to all of the great questions that are in the Q&A. Alrighty, and I'm very excited to introduce our moderator, Yvonne Gardner. Yvonne has been very involved in patient safety efforts at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, particularly from a patient advocate uh, and a family member perspective here. So Yvonne, I'm going to pass it over to you to just uh, introduce a little bit more about your background and what brought you into this work. Well, thank you very much, Olivia. Um, I lost my son after a tonsillectomy and we found out the cause of death was um, respiratory depression brought on by the opioid that he was prescribed. And we were able to take, um, we found out a lot of information about others in our area that had died in the same manner and compiled that information, was able to take it to the legislature and pass um, a bill that brought on more education for the doctors in our area and the hospitals for this problem. And we've been able to raise some awareness that this is a big problem. And, um, and the best part of it, I've been able to hear of a lot of people that have been saved because of some of the information that they have received through this legislation. Um, and Olivia, I don't know if you want me to go ahead and I'll introduce our panelists today. We've got Dr. Aether um, Tajik. Um, joining us from Norway. And if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself here in a minute, and then we've got Beth Daly Olam and Mr. Ty Moss, who's the CEO and co-founder of Niles Project. Thanks for the introduction, Yvonne. Uh, just very briefly about myself. Uh, uh, my name is Arthur Tajik. Uh, by training, I'm a cardiologist and specialist in both internal medicine and cardiology. Uh, I have a uh, I've worked in setting up the Norwegian Healthcare Investigation Board for the last three years. And formerly I was the medical director in that organization, uh, a national uh, oversight organization that investigates serious adverse events with the aim to improve uh, patient safety and, uh, and, and quality of healthcare. Currently I'm working as a associate director in MS MSD, pharmaceutical company, working in vaccines and infectious diseases. I have uh, many years of uh, interest in and working in various projects and uh, in quality and safety improvement and have also worked in health technology and innovation for Deloitte previously. Thank you so much. Um, Beth, would you like to go ahead and give us some information about your background? Sure. Hi, hi everyone. Great to be with you today. Uh, my name's Beth and like Yvonne, I lost my son to medical error um, and uh, kind of brought me in this journey into healthcare that I never thought I would, would be in. I was formerly in business, worked at McKinsey and in banking, and I pivoted to try to create some of the change to prevent future harm. 
um, that happened to my son. Um, that, that sort of led me down a, a, a path of really thinking about which are the areas that I felt um, I could have the most impact and needed to be changed. And I've worked really extensively on engaging governance in um, oversight of quality and safety, um, wrote the seminal white paper for IHI um, on what the governance role, board, board role is in governing health systems uh, on quality and safety. And I'm super proud to be involved with a fabulous group of patient advocates trying to change the US direction of patient safety by forming a WHO chapter in the US uh, called Patients for Patient Safety US and um, really trying to elevate the drift that's happened in patient safety in the U.S. And, and reprioritize and create greater accountability around that. I've also been deeply involved in the uh, candor uh, work and um, advocating and advancing the apology and disclosure um, and transparency efforts in the U.S. So great to be with all of you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Beth. And it's um, kind of as Beth points out, one person can make a huge difference. And thank you so much, Beth, for all that you've been doing. Ty, would you go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know the things that you've been working on? Sure. Thank you for having us, uh, having me on the panel today. I really appreciate that. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Niles Project. And our uh, Niles Project Foundation is a public health, patient safety, nonprofit awareness foundation that we started in 2007 my wife and I, and uh, basically to provide education and uh, bring awareness to, uh, to eliminate the preventable harm that uh, we've all experienced. Uh, we lost our 15-year-old son, Niall, in uh, 2006 to uh, MRSA, hospital-acquired infection. And uh, we've been on a, a journey since then to bring uh, education and awareness. We're not doctors, but on the uh, scale of learning things, we feel like we're almost a PhD in some of the things that we've been able to do. So we continue to work with other advocates and, and um, organizations to bring awareness. We've um, had some success here in California with some legislation, and we want to share that information with you today as we go through this. Great, thank you so much, Ty. And um, something that I'm aware of is just as a patient advocate, uh, we, I see that in Ty and Beth, we want to share the love that we had with, for our children with everyone else and help them prevent this happening in their families. All right, we're gonna move on to Beth. Beth, um, what is the Global Patient Safety Action Plan and how does legislation align here? Well, that is a big question, Yvonne. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I think that the question is, is for each of us, the Global Patient Safety Action Plan is something that was adopted by the World Health Organization in May of 2021 um, and really is a framework for looking at patient safety within your country through a lens that allows you to identify deficits or opportunities to improve patient safety. And also to be able to have a global network to talk with other countries about some of the innovation ideas that you might adopt in your country or might advocate in your country to uh, improve patient safety and, and sharing of those ideas across borders because there's some really good things happening in other places like Norway or, or England um, and, and we can bring those to the US and the US might have a nugget that we could share with um, somewhere else you know, in, in the world. And so it's, it's really this framework to really commit and advance patient safety and look at your own country's progress or you know, in the case of the US, I would say lack of progress towards patient safety on many fronts. So it's just a great tool. Um, we, for us as patient advocates in the US, we use this as a lens to look at the state of patient safety and where we wanted to prioritize some of our advocacy efforts. And so, uh, you know, the, the, what we've really observed, even though many of us have spent, you know, 15, 20 years working in patient safety, and we've had some nuggets of great success, um, the overall drift in leadership commitment and the drift in progress in patient safety is, is frankly palpable and painful in the US. And so um, this was just a good framework for us to, to 
try to identify, you know, how do we move forward from here um, in, in patient safety? All right, how does legislation influence um, the quality and safety efforts? Sure, I can, I can start on that and then I, I would love to have others jump in because certainly legislation is different based on how your country's rules are structured and your health system is structured. If you have a universal health system, um, your, your centralized approach to feedback uh, on safety issues is going to be you know, coordinated very differently than if you have a pretty disaggregated and fragmented system like in the U.S. Um, you know, so for in, in the US, our system is incredibly fragmented. The payers are fragmented. Um, the, the tracking of errors and harm is fragmented. And frankly, the, the incentives to be transparent are not, uh, do not supersede the incentives to be non-transparent in the US. The penalties are not great enough and the incentives aren't good enough. Um, so that, that, that fragmentation is one of our, our big barriers to progress. So uh, one of the things that we're using that WHO Global Patient Safety Action Plan is to, to come together as a group of patient advocates to create greater legislative and government accountability pressure. Because, you know, unlike other big patient movements, whether it's, you know, a, a issue related like heart disease or cancer or Crohn's and colitis, you know, those, you know, are, are not seen as, I think, culturally as threatening to the healthcare system, whereas I think patient safety kind of gets at the everybody's deep vulnerability in healthcare. And, and so in a way, I think culturally, there, there's just a, big, a bigger resistance to seeing the problem, owning the problem, um, similar in, in a way that you know, racial bias in healthcare is, is avoided. It's a, it's a very vulnerable and painful topic. So you know, one of the things that, that our group is doing is trying to overcome the fragmentation of the patient advocate world because so many people advocate for you know their particular niche issues but we at some point all have to come together to put greater legislative pressure um, there's just not enough commitment in at least in the US uh, to the accountability that needs to happen for both for the budget and for governmental oversight of payments related to safety, um, as well as oversight for reporting and, and things that should that are structured to happen but don't actually happen. So, you know, the, the WHO gives us a platform to come together and have those conversations and frankly, a little bit of authority to come together to, to get um, meetings that we we maybe one off couldn't as easily uh, congregate but together as a WHO group we have been much more able to to pull that together I don't know if that yes thank all. you very much Beth and um, out there on your on the international scene what do you see as far as legislation and how that is helping Sure, I'll, I'll pick up on that. And uh, I just want to pick up on some of the points that, uh, that Beth made. Um, first, addressing a little bit about the issue of fragmentation. Um, and of course, we have to understand it, it, it's, a, it's a really, we have to understand the scope and the size of the issue. And, and patient safety is, is really a really a large question. Uh, we see consistently one in 10 hospitalizations across high income countries leading in serious adverse events leading to huge costs and huge, uh, huge scale of suffering in, 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 in human terms. And uh, we see that uh, when we're talking about patient safety, we're talking about the broad issue, broad set of issues. We're talking about cultures, we're talking about processes, we're talking about procedures, behavior, use of technology, use of innovation, and uh, when addressing the barriers to actually introducing legislation, it is actually because this is such a big topic. It is such a big issue. It touches upon every aspect of medicine. Uh, and, and from a clinician's perspective, it, um, it touches upon the daily clinical uh, day to day. How do you actually improve on the processes you are doing? How do you actually learn from adverse events? How do you actually learn from serious uh, unexpected events? And we see that uh, serious adverse events, um, there is a culture of uh, shame among clinicians. 
we see that there is a, a lot of resistance against talking openly and addressing these serious adverse events from a systemic pers perspective. So, uh, so we see that there is a limit limitations regarding the understanding uh, of, of the scope and the fragmentation of the issue. So that's, that's one important barrier. Um, secondly, of course, um, every country is unique. As Beth pointed out, the US has, uh, has a more, has a larger part of its more private healthcare from our experiences here in Europe, we have a more, more of a, let's say, single payer system in many of the countries from experience in Norway. But interestingly, uh, you, you might see, you might, have ex you might expect that there is much less fragmentation in, let's say, a single payer system. And of course, I, there is probably a little less than in, let's say, in a system where you have a large private sector. But still, you see also in countries like Norway and the UK and Europe, you see that there is a lot of fragmentation. There, you have clinician professional bodies, you have patient interest groups, you have government agencies, you have NGOs, uh, you have uh, healthcare providers, and everybody's speaking different uh, from a different perspective. And, uh, and finally, I, I would also add the point that uh, I think there is also a lack of understanding perhaps on the political side, um, because uh, you do have um, in, uh, patient safety efforts that are local, but you also need something on a national level. Because of course you have, let's say, you see that there are serious adverse events in, for example, one hospital, some patient is administrated, uh, given the wrong medication. And then you see the same kind of error happening again in just the hospital across the street. And again, uh, in, in, sometimes even in the same hospital in just the department across the board, something like that. So there, there is this lack of coordination. There's this lack of a national oversight. And there's that understanding is necessary. So those are some important barriers as I see it. Thank you for sharing that with us. Ty, do you have any insights that you'd like to share with the panel and our guests as well? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, I agree with Ather and Beth as well. Legislation drives regulation and that requires a certain action. And in patient safety, it moves the process from being an option to a requirement. So that's very important, uh, trying to get things uh, in place that people will have to adhere to. So I think that's, that's key. And also it provides clarity for those that are writing regulation and for those that provide services so we are very strong advocates uh, in terms of getting regulation in place yes ty were you able to see with your work through niles project that some of the procedures were able to be changed in your local hospitals there yes we we have uh, noticed uh, a lot of changes to be honest uh, especially here in california uh, for example uh, one of the things that we worked on in 2008 was our uh, SB 1058, which was Niles, a Niles law put in place where hospitals must provide their infection rates and uh, to the public annually. And that's a very important point, uh, very hard to get through a lot of the pushback that we got from hospitals and things like that. But overall, uh, we as advocates continue to work on these it seems like it's never ending but we continue to work hard at what we uh, care about and hopefully uh, through that effort we find we do get things done so it just takes a lot of push we need a lot of a lot more people doing what we're doing Ivana, one one thought i had um like niles the, the the law that, that you guys created took a long time and it's it's so much work to push these laws through um and and it's always a trade-off of do you introduce new legislation where you have to introduce new legislation versus is there existing legislation and government oversight that just isn't being implemented or executed so um just an example would be one of the things that um, our group did is 
we literally mapped the patient safety ecosystem on a national government oversight level in the US. So from the CDC to the which, you know, Centers for Disease Control to um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to you know, the FDA to, you know, so all the different organizations that have their hand in the pot of, of managing patient safety. And then we went down in each of those organizations and we mapped out what are their specific levers of, you know, what, what actually do they oversee and then we actually said, you know, okay, how do we actually get them to turn up that lever? What could we change? Could we add questions to the hospital surveys around safety? Could we, you know, ask them to produce a congressional report on accountability of the, the budget towards safety? You know, so, so, you know, there's always this trade-off of do we, you know, where is new legislation needed and where is, is there existing oversight that's just gotten lax and, and you more need to turn up the pressure? Yeah, so Beth, on that, how, how are we able to track the legislation and keep that in front of our hospitals and administrators, those that are making the policies? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's state legislation and then there's national legislation, right? And, and one of the challenges as patient advocates, most of us are people in our own homes, you know, just doing this out of passion. You know, we don't have a giant lobbying firm that tracks legislation. You know, we don't have the, the dollars of big pharma and medical device and so on and so forth that, that can track legislation that relates to them. Or in the case of the US, the big lobbying of the American Hospital Association, you know, so it's really hard, you know, one to, to track legislation and to propose legislation. So we've kind of taken, um, and so I think if you have a very targeted issue, uh, like you did for Niles's law, um, I think it's really effective to do legislation. If, if you're trying to, I think, move a lot of different pieces, we've worked more through the relationships that we've built, like really getting to know the people at these different organizations and work with them to know what the oversight is and, and trying to ideate or innovate with them on how to uh, elevate the pressure. And you know, it's, it's our fault also as, as advocates in the US not having aggregated to create greater pressure. You know, one person calling a big healthcare organization like, you know, that, that does oversight, like the Joint Commission, usually doesn't get heard. But if we had thousands of people calling or thousands of people writing, we would get heard. So as patient advocates, we have not done what other patient movements have done, which is aggregate our voice to create deeper you know, noticeable pressure. And, and I do think that's a, a fault for us, at least in the US. I don't know how it is elsewhere in the world, but I, I think that, you know, really being strategic about what you wanna change and aggregating the voice to elevate that change um, is, is effective. And as opposed to just going, to, going in and generically, I, I've seen so many patient talks where people are like, we need better safety. But like we have to actually, you know, roll up our sleeves and say, what does that mean? Okay, does that mean we need, you know, different questions on the hospital questionnaires? Does that mean we need different penalties for safety events? Does that mean we need different um, incentives for hospitals doing high reliability? Uh, you know, I, I think too often it's just patient advocates have not taken the time to, you know, to really figure out what that means when we say we want better safety. Um, so I would just uh, I would like to pick up on on those some of those ideas right. and uh, um, of course um, uh, coming from Norway and from a European uh, context it's not easy to fully understand the U.S. context but I think it's worth um, making some reflections on the differences. Uh, for one thing, as I of course you, the U.S. is a very large country. It's a, it's it's geographically diverse. It's it's huge area and a huge population and very, very diverse, both state and federal kind of legislation. Uh, so I can imagine that it's, uh, it's a much bigger challenge to, to, as you say, have a unified voice in the, in the US uh, for patient advocacy groups. But like, what I can do, what I, what, I, what, I, what I can say is that what has been successful in European countries, 
is uh, the alliance or the trifecta, you might say, of the patient advocacy combined with the with clinicians, clinic strong support from clinicians. And this has been a kind of a recent development because uh, if you go back just a few decades, clinicians, uh, they wouldn't, they didn't really understand patient safety because they said, okay, but we are just trying to do our clinical work according to the best uh, medical practice that is patient safety. So they had a very, they had a very sim simplistic understanding. They didn't understand the systems level. They didn't understand that there's a culture there are mechanisms. There's, there's all this, this, these things around it. So this, this change in mentality among a, a larger and larger portion among the clinicians. So you have the alliance between the patient advocacy groups and the clinicians. And in addition, you have the politicians on the side, on the same side. So you, you need, you need some champions in the political sphere that really understand the, the systemic approach. And the systemic approach, it means. Of course, you can't summarize it in one sentence, but it's it's not about it, some somebody gives the wrong medication or some serious uh, misprocedure. Uh, some procedure is pre performed in a wrong way, and it, just focusing on that narrow issue. It's looking uh, looking at what's what caused that. Going a step back, looking at education, looking at financial incentives, looking at evaluation, looking at all this, all this, these things that are surrounding it, and having politicians that understand that. So, kind of, kind of having that alliance is is absolutely necessary to kind of push uh, legislation. But again, I can imagine in a country as large as the U.S. that is compounded this these challenges. But I, I think you know, in Europe, you've done a better job of institutionalizing the patient role in uh, the the feedback and oversight process that we have in the US. In the US, you know, there's some hospitals that have really integrated the patient role. And then I work with a lot of hospital boards. There are other hospitals whose board would never talk to a patient and, and who don't have patient um, and family engagement processes and, and panels. So it's just hugely variant in the US, whereas I think in Europe, it's, it's institutionalized and, and a deeper cultural commitment to it. So for us, we really do need the government push in a way to say, no, everybody has to do this. And then the, you know, the accreditation process for hospitals will look at that or the condition of participation process for um, government payments will, will consider that. So you're, you're, you're ahead of us. <laughs> but, but, I would know. agree. I would agree as well. Uh, you know, patient efforts uh, is fragmented here in the United States for sure, and that's uh, there's no true collective voice, and it's it's very complex. Patient safety efforts are very complex, and as you mentioned, things that happen federally and things that happens in the states are can be totally different. There's uh, different efforts underway. So the thing that we found at work or helped us initially was reaching out to other uh, organizations and found out what they're doing and how we could join and be a part of what they were all about as well and support those efforts as long as we were all, you know, finding our, our passion and working together. So I think that's important. It's a, uh, it's the, uh, a lifelong effort to be honest uh, for us something that you continue to do and you take those little wins as you go but bottom line is uh, you have to have a passion for this this type of work that we do and um, you know it's not easy for everybody so um, we've had success but we again would like to see a lot more federally we'd like to see a lot more people involved and that's why I think we're we're uh, talking about this where we can't do this alone we have to work together and you know we're happy to do whatever we can do uh, share our stories and provide any kind of background that we've uh, had success at so really it's uh it's an ongoing process so I'm really glad to be a part of the, the conversation here at this point Hi, did you see that a lot of um, a lot of your success came with educating the people when you're working on your project? Absolutely. Uh, it was a matter of educating your family, friends, 
that's where we started. And, you know, also uh, joining other organizations to uh, find out what they were doing and, you know, and seeing how we can support each other. That's really the key. It's, it's a grassroots kind of a thing for us anyway. And then and as Beth mentioned, there's a lot of uh, other work going on domestically and internationally as well. Uh, like what Ather's doing and sharing stories, sharing information. Um, and over time, you, you, see, you see progress. You know, we've all seen progress and uh, that's why we do what we do. So that's, you know, that's, that's really the key to it all. And we've, we've, had, we've had our challenges, but we feel it's worth every effort, every, every time we get a chance to talk to people, to be a part of uh, these types of programs, panels, whatever it might be. Uh, we jump at that. Yvonne, I would love to add, like, I think my, my patient advocacy journey really changed. Like, you know, first after I lost my son, it was uh, much like my ecosystem was small. It was about, you know, preventing that harm in that hospital where that harm happened, right? And, and making sure that there was learning and in a way that his death wasn't in vain, right? And then it kind of evolved to, I had this greater understanding of the barriers to learning after harm. So my, my passion really became, you know, how do I help other hospital systems have shared learning systems? And, and I think there's somewhat of an organic evolution because as I then started to understand the quality infrastructure, the risk management infrastructure, which is also you know, often separate from quality, and then the, the state and governmental oversight, you know, my vision of, of what I wanted to change went from changing within one hospital system to changing within many hospital systems to what's the role of legislation and governmental oversight and um, you know, independent body oversight to create incentives for that kind of learning and improvement. So you know, wherever you are in your advocate journey, you might be at the point where you just want your hospital to make change, to, to learn from that event. And, and that's like, that's, that's a really good place to honor and, and try to make that change on a, on, a, on a one hospital level. And that change can help tons of people. And you might be at the point where you say, you know, my hospital's not interested in learning, but I want to, you know, work with other health systems or my hospital already made changes. And I want to make sure other hospitals make these kind of changes or everyone in my state makes that kind of change. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's important to kind of think about your own journey and really reflect, you know, what's important to me, what change is important to me to make. And then as you understand that ecosystem better, you know, figuring out what you want to change might evolve, and, th and that's okay. Um, and I, I do want to emphasize one thing that's helped in my patient advocate journey has been the power of, you know, really rolling up my sleeves and getting in the weeds of how payment works, how legislation works, how, you know, accountability in all these different ways works. And then the power of, you know, conversation and collaboration with other advocates, with other quality leaders, you know, people who care about safety want to help other people who care about safety make change. So, you know, really uh, committing to some of that collaboration and conversation. So, you know, roll up your sleeves and get in the weeds so that when you come to those conversations, you know, you understand the payments, you understand the ecosystem, you understand, you know, that quality is often separate from risk in the U.S. and, and what that means, um, that, that you're, you're game on um, and, and, and be willing to learn and collaborate and, you know, join panels or join um, working groups to learn more. Yeah, I agree. And the other thing I would mention, too, is you know important change happens you know when there's true transparency, and that's really something that we have worked on, just trying to make sure that we all are understanding what Beth just mentioned that we are all doing what we can do to make sure that these 
organizations are providing, especially government agencies are providing uh, true transparency so people can share and understand better. Mm. I would like to also address the importance of uh, advocacy, both patient and family advocacy. And uh, from experiences in many European countries, many of the many of the most important legislative efforts have been championed by by ad, by patients and and their families, and actually led to real change. So that that's one important lesson to kind of to to bring bring with us that this this is actually an important tool because the the power of the individual story the is, is uh, has the effect of kind of lifting these can have the effect of lifting these things up to a national level and both in those cases that i'm most familiar with in norway and in the uk the, for example the norwegian healthcare investigation board was set up um, shortly after the the health minister uh, had direct conversations with uh, individual patients that had been advocating for such a national oversight organization for many years uh, another thing I want to point out to the importance of advocacy is uh, what we have seen is within the medical field, it, perhaps over years, you have, uh, let's say, an, a narrow way of thinking and a limited set of tools that you're using. And what we have seen is that some of the families and the patients that are advocating for change, they're bringing in completely new tools. Some of them, they are engineers, they've worked in quality control, let's say, in the airline industry, maybe they have worked in the military, maybe they have some experience from the global telecom industry, something completely different. And they're bringing ideas and tools that kind of address systemic improvement, data-driven improvement, monitoring, that's completely different from what we have seen previously from people working in quality improvement in, in healthcare. And also we have seen, uh, which I think is very, very important because we see now that tech and innovation is becoming more and more important. It's actually a tool of empowerment for patients. It's, it gives them the ability to both to monitor their own data, but it also gives them a tool to control their own kind of um, their own uh, their own medical history and so on. And we see that uh, there is in patient advocacy and patients that uh, push that aspect as well has been very important in the patient safety aspect. So it's, it's an absolutely important um, it's, it's important to get involved and to, important to kind of get your sleeves rolled up and, and get in, involved if you, are in, if you are interested in bringing your competence and your viewpoints to the table. Catherine, you made such a good point. Um, in my situation with my son, the ENT that operated on him and did his tonsillectomy was our, biz, our biggest advocate as far as pushing through the legislation. Once we gathered data, we lived in a small town, about 20 to 30,000 people. And we were able to go back a few years and find five different cases um, of patients that had died the same way as my son. And a few of those were his patients, a few weren't, but with some other information that we had gathered, he could see the need for more tools, just like you said, that would help the healthcare system um, do a better job and make it easier on them. So he did go to some engineers, to some large companies and say, this is exactly what we need. And they, that company um, was able to work on that for a few years and engineer products that would keep patients from dying. You know, in my case, my son's case from respiratory depression at home once they were um, sent home. So I, I appreciate you bringing that point out that there are tools out there, there's people, um, ones listening that work in the medical profession and others that maybe have seen a need and work in different fields that could help solve some of the issues that we face every day, you know, as in the medical communities. All right, we've got just a few more minutes. Ty or Beth or um, Ather, is there something else you'd like to add? You know, I, I would just add that if you're not at the point where you are ready to do sort of state or national legislative change, you know, you can do change within your health system of just, you know, making sure that the patient committee reports to the board and asking what percentage of your, if this is more in the U.S. for, for board, boards of health systems, what percentage of their board time is spent on quality and safety 
um, because, you know, frankly, if it's not a priority in the boardroom, it's just not a priority for the leadership team. So that is something that we encourage all patient advocates to push, you know, just on a, a very local level is, you know, is our leadership team spending time on this? Um, and does the board walk around, do a safety round, look at the safety dashboard, look at the, you know, total dollars spent on um, medical malpractice and the total number of claims? You know, there's a, a lot of basic uh, safety metrics that the board should be looking at, um, never events and your, you know, infection rates and all that sort of stuff that we all know about. And, and if they're not looking at it, you know, the patients within a small ecosystem of a hospital or a health system can create pressure, aggregate pressure to, at a minimum, get that board to look at it and have that be part of the CEO and leadership team compensation. Just another idea, like if, you know, some, for some people, legislative change feels like huge, but, you know, there's, there's different ways to create change and create pressure. And, you know, everybody has to kind of figure out what's right for, for them at their point in their advocacy journey. One of the things that we've been working on with the uh, patient safety movement is the National Patient Safety Board. I think that's, as you mentioned, Beth, very, very important that we have uh, something like that and implemented. Um, it's just like the NTSB, uh, it's important. It can help uh, implement uh, and regulate healthcare policy and to you know, make for better patient outcomes. So I think that's, that's something we all need uh, support on and we surely want to promote that to the folks that are listening. And uh, it's going to help us all domestically. Just a brief right. point on, just a very brief point on that, on that and, 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 and I really do agree with what Ty is saying and, and, and what Sarah pointed out. We, we need efforts on all levels. So quality improvement happens on the local level, but at the same time, you need that national oversight. And that is because of the large volume of reports of adverse events, the, the large volume of underreporting, there are large areas we don't know anything about. You need somebody thinking about it strategically. Where, where should we put our efforts in to get the most, uh, to get the most improvement for most people? All right, we're gonna be moving on to some um, Q and A. And so feel free, anyone on the panel here that would like to answer these questions. Um, the first question is, what are the examples of levers in organizations? Someone like to comment on that? Sure, I think, you know, in, in different countries, your, your structures are gonna be different. You have, I think of levers as carrots and sticks, right? Some of the levers are things like accreditation, like are you allowed to be open as, as a hospital? Um, some of the levers are payment, uh, like your, your how much you get paid or how much you don't get paid if a, an event, um, a, a harm event happens. Um, some of the levers can be reputational, uh, like, you know, the star system in the US or um, leap, leapfrog recognition. Um, so you, you have level, levers that are dollars, you have levers that are reputation, and you have levers that can deeply affect your ability to exist, right? Um, and, and all of those are levers that patient safety leaders and advocates should be looking at of, you know, I, you can't push for all of those levers to change at, what time, at, at one time, you know, so which of those levers is gonna be most important or most effective at changing the, the particular issue that you're working to change? Um, so that's one of the things that we went through with the, our group, our WHO group is, is looking and really mapping out each organization and the levers within that organization that they control, whether it's reporting or payment or incentives like reputational incentives. So I, I we're happy to share that in the US with anyone. Join us and I'll put in my thing in the chat if you wanna join us and, and you know we'll share that all with you. So. 
I would like to jump in on, on the first two questions as well, as well. the question on the levers and then the, what's, what's in it for them, for the clinicians. Um, so so uh, absolutely, I agree, carrots and, and sticks, both are important, but um, uh, I do believe uh, that uh, the carrots are more important than the sticks. Uh, of, of course, we, we do need sanctions. Of course, there is gross malpraxis. There are doctors who completely kind of, um, uh, their, their conduct is uh, completely not uh, acceptable. And that, that, that's, that, that, those are some cases, but that's not really not what we are talking about. Those doctors, they should be sanctioned and so on. They should uh, perhaps even have their license revoked. But for the majority of clinicians, doctors, nurses, healthcare personnel, they go to work and they really, really want to do a good job. They want to help people. They, they, are, they are completely ex running themselves to exhaustion to, to use their best efforts to, to help people. But still, these same doctors and these same nurses, they, they still they do serious, they are involved in serious adverse events. And uh, they, they are related to human factors. They're related to how their shifts are set up, how the payment and structures are set up, how they are incentivized perhaps to do unnecessary procedures or unnecessary diagnostics where there is no need for that and so on. So uh, the most powerful levers are those that facilitate, because if really what we want to do is that we want the majority, this is the majority, the majority want to do a good job and they want, they know how to do a good job, but they, they need the help. And the most powerful lever is to facilitate and go into conversation with them and ask, you know, how can we use our story? How can we use our voices to together kind of uh, help you address these issues that you need to do to address, to do a good job? And that has to do with, with, all, with all kinds of things that, that's, that's on a systemic level. Uh, and so we, we need both, but uh, the, the carrot part is more powerful. And I think the other thing, encouraging um, shared learning, the, a collaboration between shared learning organizations, like I'm involved with Solutions for Patient Safety, which is a pediatric um, shared learning organization committed to advancing safety that's had huge success in the U.S. and we have about 140 uh, pediatric hospitals where, you know, there's shared all teach all learn committed um, advancement of everybody has to identify their, their issues and then come up with collective solutions. Um, and then whoever's doing really well on, on certain of the metrics has a responsibility to teach everybody else. So, you know, as patient advocates, you can push to say, are, you know, you involved in a shared learning network and how can you help uh, your organizations be involved in, in one of those shared learning efforts? And um, like you guys said, my experience with legislation was, a lot easier. Um, and to answer the third question we had on here about how people can use social media to be heard um, for legislation. When my son passed away, you know, of course it got out on Facebook what had happened and everything and instantly, I mean, I didn't see those responses for a few weeks later, but instantly I got lots of um, replies of this same thing happening to this person's um, you know, child or niece or nephew or brother and sister and how, and so I was able to gather a lot of information that way. And then after my son's autopsy came back, I reached out to those parents or those people that had contacted me through Facebook to gather some more information. And like when Ty was talking about it earlier, Mostly when we went to the legislature, it was just presenting the information and educating them. We didn't get one negative vote. And they were so shocked that this was happening to people that were just taking their prescription as they were um, prescribed and that it could kill them. And, and that they didn't know that that was such a deadly alternative to um, reducing their pain. So for us, um, as far as, we just wanted to get the information out there so no one else had to die like this for no reason when it's totally preventable. Um, 
And as far as using social media, I think it's a good thing just to let people know what is happening because sometimes a lot of these incidences get swept under the rug and, and that's what had happened in our community. And so when people had contacted me and said, well, did you know, you know this happened to a little three-year-old just, just a year ago, when I was told that this was just kind of a freak storm of events that my healthy 20, 21 year old son could die in his sleep, you know, and then that was just a freak storm of events. I knew that that was not right. Especially when I started getting other people that would collaborate and say, no, you know, my three-year-old died the same way. My 32 year old child died the same way. Mm -hmm. So I think um, like Ather says, you know, it's getting information out there and trying to collaborate and correct these issues. Anyone like to? Yeah, I, Ty? I would add to that. And, you know, when Niall passed away in 2006, there was not much for us to, to gather information from. It was Google, that type of thing. But uh, today we have so many other tools that provide a lot of transparency and a lot of uh, input. So I think, um, I think it's helped us a lot. It's a good way for people to get involved, to learn uh, initially, especially if they don't have any background in healthcare and they want to, but they want to help uh, to do some investigating and uh, through social media. And I think it's such a, a great tool. There's so many different organizations out there today that can provide information. And um, we even had a time where we were doing a lot of drive time radio uh, uh, on particular subjects uh, with organizations and radio stations around the nation uh, wanted to have us on to talk about our story and our journey. And we found that to be very, very helpful, very uh, enlightening. A lot of good questions came to us from that. Uh, I also mentioned that I'm a musician, so I spent a lot of time uh, with other musicians and people that uh, provide music. And we've used music as a tool for our uh, advocacy. That's helped us get the word out about what, uh, what happened in our particular situation. And it's allowed us to, uh, learn from others, uh, their stories as well. And that's really the key. It's just uh, the grassroots piece of it, of just getting out, talking to other people, providing uh, any way that you can get the word out to bring people in that want to help. There's a lot of people want to help, but they just don't know how. And uh, these are some things that we are able to share and happy to share. I would, I would just add that um, the, I think the ben biggest benefit that um, social media and has provided to me was a community because I think, you know, losing a child from medical error or losing anyone is a very isolating thing. You know, it's not the same. It's a, it's a bizarre uh, injustice. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, I remember finding uh, like Carol Hemelgar and Sue Sheridan, and we it was like this this bond that like oh we 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 see each other's pain and um, that that was that was very consoling to me, but also this empowerment that like being with other people who kind of understood this this crazy stuff that we were trying to do and helping each other figure that out. Um, and, and, you know, the collaboration that it connects you to people that are, are hard to connect with without that. Um, so the, the, it helps break through those, those barriers and, um, and helps you get mentored because I think a lot of the knowledge that, that I've developed, you know, since 2003 has just, it's, it's hard to gather that structural knowledge, the legislative knowledge, and, and I'm the first to say there's so much that I, I just don't know. Um, so I'm I'm just grateful for the that I have now this community of of people that I can call to say, help me understand how do H caps actually work, you know, or help me understand, you know, how how does the joint commission process actually work. I mean, now I know those things, but I didn't before. And, and to have the mentors through social media to, to ask the questions of how do I make the change that I, I'm trying to make? 
um, or someone to guide you to help you figure out what change you might want to make. I just want to also very briefly address the a little bit the question of transparency and the importance of transparency. Uh, of course, when, when you're hit by such a tragic uh, incident, somebody has this kind of in incident in their family or it, it hits them, it's, a, it's an isolating experience. So just, just having the, the option, the possibility to connect with others and share your information that's from a, from a human perspective, from an emotional perspective, it's, it's absolutely important, but, but also from just from an information sharing, because it's, it's really, it, it's interesting, the, the story you, we have mentioned here, many of these stories, uh, similar stories uh, with opioid overdosing in, in hospital is, you, has happened many times also in Norway and also in the UK. So it's, it's interesting that something can feel so isolating and that this is, this just happened with me, but in reality, it turns out that this is something that happens over and over and over again, both in the US, even in the same department, as you mentioned, and in other countries. So that points to underlying, underlying issues. And, uh, and, and that again points to having uh, access to system, systemized data. So health registries, transparency of registries, transparency of hospital data, transparency of operational data, clinical data, of course, taking uh, personal uh, data safety into consideration is also an important area of advocacy. Yeah, I would say one, one other thing too. Um, you know, over the years uh, working on uh, patient safety issues, you know, we felt kind of isolated in a way because it was kind of our focus, MRSA, C. diff, those types of things, sepsis. But now that we've had this pandemic hit, it really is, I think, open opportunities for especially advocates because this affects everybody. The pandemic has created the awareness of people having family problems and issues that they have to deal with. And uh, it's, I think it's opened a lot of people's eyes that may not have paid as much attention to what, what we've been working on for lots of years. All righty, everybody. Well, it's it's very hard to follow a discussion with the expertise, the emotion, the engagement, um, and the, the historical experience that our panelists have had. And I do want to thank each and every one of you, Yvonne, for being our wonderful moderator, uh, Beth, Ty, and Ather for teaching me things that I mean, in a lifetime I, I never would have been able to acquire myself. So I really, really appreciate your time today. Um, I do just want to, you know, kind of close out here with a few housekeeping items. There were some wonderful questions that we didn't get to answer today live. You can expect us to develop an FAQ informed by our panelists and our moderator, and that'll be posted on YouTube with this recording um, in about three days or so. So you can see that FAQ on uh, YouTube if we didn't get around to answering your Q&A. And I'll also, you know, look at the folks who we didn't get to answer. I'll send that Q and or FAQ to you uh, directly. Um, some other things here is that, again, we are offering board certified patient advocate credit. You're going to get one hour of CE if you registered as such. You can expect to receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation in about five to seven days here. And of course, if you have any questions about that, please go ahead and reach out to us. Uh, the last thing here is we are doing our best to keep these efforts free and to, you know, provide free CE for, you know, uh, our patient advocates and for some of our webinars, our physicians, our nurses, our pharmacists, etc. If you are able to donate, please do. You can go to patientsafetymovement.org and you'll see a donate button right at the top of the screen there. Um, again, I do want to thank all of our panelists for your wonderful expertise and the time that you put in into developing this content here today. And to our panelists, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or, or ideas for us. And again, until next time, we'll see you soon. <laughs>